Welcome to my Top Down Network Design, Chapter 4. In this chapter, we're looking at characterizing the network traffic. This actually is not really that long of a chapter, so that's kind of nice. So, network traffic factors, we have to understand traffic flow. How does traffic flow in our network? Again, you're going to have to look at this from a design or architect point of view, not so much as a router switch type of person. While you do have to understand flow of data from a router switch perspective, but it's more than just that. You also have to look at things like location of the traffic source and the data stores. Are we putting data uh, or resources that are being heavily accessed on a slower backbone network? Are we putting them on older switches? Are we centralizing them? Where are we putting them and how does that relate to resource flow from them? So those are kind of important. Traffic load. Uh, do we have one key port that is actually becoming a point of failure? Do we have one port that actually is accessing the vast majority of, the, of our data or data stores or resources? Uh, for example, I did one design where or one review where they had a nice th uh, three tiered structure, access distribution and core, but on a lot of the distributions to their core, they did one, up, uh, one uplink and all of their servers were in their core, which that's not bad, but all of the basic access traffic that needed access to those resources had to travel to the distribution and from that one distribution switch had one uplink to the core. So that one uplink was heavily saturated. So that was, became a, a concern. Traffic behavior, that's also another big one. Uh, peaking times, uh, what areas, what times, what days uh, does traffic behave uh, differently? That's not really hard to, to monitor or figure out. So that's kind of an important one to know as well as are there any type of QoS or COS requirements? So they're all big ones. So user community is another big one. Uh, departments, groups, the size of them, locations, maybe applications, if they're sensitive or not. Data stores, again, what data stores are being accessed, what resources, location, what applications, things of that nature as well as who's using them, because they're all kind of important. That gets you an overview of how the network flow is, is happening. And again, general network flow, where they're going, where they're going, things of that nature. Why is that important? Big part of that is so that you can do a map like this. So you can figure out bandwidth that's going to be needed. Now, again, here we're, lo we're talking about kilobits per second. This is a little bit more unrealistic because, again, with current developments in networking, we're talking megs, we're talking 100 gigabits, 10 gig, 40 gig, things of that nature. But again, this is still a really good example of how you do basic design. Understanding how to design a CAN, campus area network. What buildings? What are the applications being ran in the building? How much bandwidth they're going to need? Again, bandwidth totals aren't going to be in the kilobits, but same principle applies. Types of traffic flow. Again, are they going to be at terminal, uh, terminal services, remote management, client server, some type of VDI or thin client, client server, server to server, uh, replication, syncing, maybe some type of clustering or database management. Uh, virtualized servers, virtualizing hardware, virtualizing network infrastructure, virtualizing desktops, or things of that nature. So again, there's lots of things when it comes to different types of data flow. We haven't even touched any type of voice. Because voice and video both have a real-time component. So the flow associated with the transmission of these, they take on a whole new layer of complexity. Because again, this real time cannot have a delay. A phone needs to talk to a server or a switch so that the phone numbers and addressing can function so that the end users can actually do 
phone calls. We were acting one incident where our network design kind of broke down and due to a, a switch installation that was gone wrong and all of our voice VLAN started disappearing. So our phone system got all wonky for four days and no one knew why. It was not a project that I was working with. It was more of a, I worked as a faculty member there and the network engineer pointed out the issue. So this this does happen in real life. So you do want to make sure that you have the appropriate traffic flow maps and things of that nature. Application based off of traffic characteristics. Again, QoS requirements, protocols, types of traffic, what resources, name of application. All of this type of things are important because all of this goes back to how do we actually categorize, organize our data structure? How do we organize our network? How do we know it's real traffic, abnormal traffic, traffic that just randomly occurs? How do we know? We, without this type of documentation, we don't. Traffic load could be the number of workstations, could be average latency time to access a resource, or could just be a uh, load on those pieces of equipment, the load on the switch, the load on the router, the load on the link, as it communicates with different layers. All of these become important information that you have to be able to detail. Size of objects on the network. Again, these numbers are kind of realist are unrealistic. Some of them maybe, but we're talking megs and hundreds of megs and gigs and things of that nature, because this is more of the transmission and storage. So we have to remember bits versus bytes and how much data are we passing on the network. For example, a simple web page, it may only be 50 kilobytes, but then the communication of that web page has to go through some type of kilobit per second connection or megabit per second or gigabit per second or so forth. But we have to understand the size of the objects that we're sending and receiving. Again, everything goes back to that documentation. Traffic flow, whether it be a broadcast, multicast, or any cast, or heck, even unicast. Because this right now is only focusing on IPv4, hence the broadcast. Again, understanding the broadcast domains, understanding the collision domains. This is important because if you're using older technology like switches and hubs in your environment, this is going to affect your environment. Understanding the broadcast domains. If we have one large broadcast domain like a campus area network, it's campus wide, and a PC sends a broadcast, there's a wasted resources going everywhere just because the improper segmentation of broadcast domains. That's a huge thing. All right, network efficiency. That could be things like overhead because of link failure, overhead because of retransmission, overhead because of things like frame sizing. Are we using the traditional 1500 MPU? Are we using a jumbo frame? Are we dealing with certain protocols that have overhead? What about windowing or error recovery mechanisms if a collision does happen? Again, we've already talked about these in previous chapters. But these are all things that you have to think about when you're talking about efficiency. Uh, CO, sorry, QoS and COS requirements. Things like, are we looking at a constant bit rate, a real-time bit rate? Are we looking at available bit rate? Are we talking about a guaranteed bit rate or frame rate? All of these get brought into play when we're looking at certain services. While this particular service is more looking at the ATM service specification, these can still apply to other services, real-time versus non-real-time, constant versus guaranteed versus availability. All of these come into play, so we have to keep that in mind. We have to understand the flow of traffic in our network so that we can understand what is our constant bit rate per day, per time, time area, during peak time versus non-peak time. All of these are critical. Then we have QoS requirements per the IETF group. 
And again, that's going to be guaranteed services or load services that are going to be more controlled. Again, it just kind of depends on how we're doing it. If we're doing guaranteed, it will provide a firm mathematical provable bounds on end-to-end -end querying, where the controlled load balancing provides client data so you can approximate it. So again, we have to pick and choose what's going to be the right type of tool for our environment. The IETF does differentiate services work groups based off a of specific uh, RFC, it should be 2475, as well as the way that we can uh, categorize our packets. That's going to be the differentiated service code points, or DSCP, and how that influences or works with the querying and the drop decisions for our IP datagrams. That's actually it for this chapter. Again, we want to make sure that you have a good understanding of flow, load, behavior, and general QoS requirements. I want to leave you with some review questions. You want to look at some of the common different types of traffic. You want to make traffic flow and voice over IP a challenging based off the characteristics and plan for it. Voice over IP or other real-time traffic. Why should you be concerned about broadcasts or any casts or multicasts? And how do ATM and EFTF specifications for QoS differ? That one's not super, super important anymore because ATM is more of a, an outdated technology. But again, Understanding how IFTF specifications for QS differs from other variations, that's the point here. I want to thank you for your time. 